How do some cities punch above their weight when it comes to hosting big sporting events? We'll dive into that with Patrick Talty, the president of the Indiana Sports Corp. Plus, MLB incorporated Negro League stats into its official records, Greenland is making a move in global soccer, and a volleyball coach got a big raise so that he could buy a horse. It's Thursday, May 30th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Greenland is looking to move up in the world of global soccer. The territory has applied to be a member of CONCACAF, soccer's governing body of North and Central America. Greenland is looking to host games and compete internationally. With an area larger than Mexico and a population half that of Fargo, North Dakota, Greenland would actually not be the least populous country or territory in CONCACAF. With around 57,000 people, it is more than Montserrat and Anguilla combined. In fact, Montserrat, which is east and a little south of Puerto Rico, only has around 5,000 people, so precedent is on Greenland's side here. Those two Caribbean islands provide another helpful point of comparison because, like Greenland, they are both territories of European countries. Greenland is, of course, a territory of Denmark, while both Caribbean islands are territories of the UK, so that shouldn't be an issue as far as CONCACAF membership is concerned. Eventually, CONCACAF could have matches between Caribbean nations and one of the coldest places on Earth. The home field advantage in those could be significant. MLB has now incorporated the stats from seven Negro Leagues that played from 1920 to 1948 into their official statistics. The leader for career batting average, career slugging percentage, and single season batting average is now Josh Gibson, considered by many to be the greatest player of his era and by some to be the greatest player of all time. MLB designated seven Negro Leagues as official major leagues in 2020, and their stats are being added in after a painstaking effort from a committee that included people from the MLBPA, Goliath Sports Bureau, the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, the Seamheads Negro League Database, and many others. Since the news broke, some have been celebrating, and some people have been saying that, hey, whatever the circumstances were, you can't compare numbers from two different leagues with completely different sets of players. And sure, there's some truth to that, but there's no particular reason that the leagues that excluded black players should be the official record as opposed to the leagues that let them play. After all, Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb got to rack up stats in leagues that artificially suppress the talent pool and not for good reasons. Because the stats don't tell the whole picture, if you want a fuller understanding of pre-integration baseball, there are a lot of great books and films and now even video games that can help you learn about the Negro Leagues. And if you do... I believe you'll find that the talent there was just as good as anywhere else. And finally, the University of Nebraska announced a new contract with its volleyball coach, John Cook, who is net getting a $70,000 raise to $825,000. It's not explicitly stated in the contract that the raise is so he can buy a horse, but it's so he can buy a horse. Cook said, quote, when Troy and I talked about my contract, I proposed that instead of an annual escalating salary that some coaches do, it would mean a great deal to me if the Nebraska Athletic Department would consider supporting me in purchasing a horse out in central Nebraska that I've had my eye on. Goes on to explain that they couldn't specifically write that into the contract, but that's where the money's going. And hey, whatever it takes to keep a top volleyball coach. I'm joined now by the president of the Indiana Sports Corp, Patrick Talty. Welcome, Patrick. Great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you on. So the Indiana Sports Corp uh, brings sporting events to Indiana. That includes the most recent NBA All-Star Weekend. You've had the men's Final Fours roughly every five years or so since 1980, 2022 college football playoff, the 2012 Super Bowl, many more. How much of what you do are these big events that you know any sport fan will have heard of versus you know, more of the smaller to mid-sized ones? Yeah, you know, obviously everyone hears about the big, huge events that we that we put on and, and including the Olympic swimming trials that are happening this summer uh, inside of a, a football stadium. First time ever that that's ever been done. And and those are the marquee events. And those are the ones that everyone knows about. That's what makes Indy famous. That's what you know people come for. But we've hosted over since our inception in 1979, we've hosted over 500 different championships, uh, national and international events um, that equals $4 billion of economic impact. And those range from everything from um, you know, rowing, uh, Division One men's and women's uh, rowing championships to the Final Four to uh, the PNG uh, gymnastics championships to um, fencing national championships to um, the national half marathon uh, uh, national championship that will be occurring this uh, this September. Um, you know, we've hosted it's all different sizes of events that we've that we've hosted throughout the time. Many topics I want to get to. I'm just curious about the of swimming trials in a football stadium, what went into that 
decision to, you know, use the biggest possible venue for something like that? Yeah, you know, it was, that's a great question. And, and we really, um, when we were thinking about this, we wanted to elevate the, the, the uh, uh, sport of swimming. And we thought no better way to do it than to put it inside a football stadium and allow the most people possible to come and experience it. Omaha has done a great job of hosting the Olympic swimming trials for the last, you know, since 2004. Um, lots of people have seen it. it's been exciting. But now was the time we really felt like, hey, you know, let's let's elevate the game and let's let's have more people experience. Let's get more tickets out there so that folks can come who would not otherwise be able to come. And, and we're centrally located. Um, so we're within an eight hour drive of over 50 percent of USA Swimming's uh, membership. Uh, we're a huge swimming community ourselves. And so we felt like this was the perfect time, the perfect community. And oh, by the way, in 1924, when the uh, Par when the Olympics were hosted in the Paris, the Olympic team for swimming was chosen at Broad Ripple Park here in Indianapolis. So 100 years later, we're choosing the Olympic team again here in Indianapolis. This time we're just doing it in a much uh, bigger venue. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Take us inside the process of securing something like the Final Four or a Big Ten football championship. What actually goes on to... Uh, win hosting rights for one of those events. Yeah, you know, it's it is a it's a lot of work and it is fierce competition. I mean, you know, when we started in 1979, we were the first sports commission in the country and now there's over 350 of them competing uh, for these events and you know, we we have a very good relationship with lots of our competitors, but we all compete very hard. Um, we we all want these events for our community. We want to grow our community. We want the benefits for our community. So you have to work hard at them. You really have to think about, you know, how do I put the best foot forward? How do I show the assets that I have in my community? And and how do you show your history and hosting and the success that you've had, but yet um, not rest on that lore, on those laurels and, and rest on the past? You know, when, when we start to look at these events, you know, we put a, it's a wide funnel that we have. And, and we think about this in, in terms of like, let's throw everything we can in this funnel and start to evaluate them as they go further and further down the funnel. You know, we want to look at, is it the right time of the year? Do we have the right venues for it? Do we have the right kind of, um, you know, fans, you know, do we have the resources to put these on? And, and, you know, as we get further down that funnel, you know, we realize, okay, here are the events that we think we want to bid on. And so it, this doesn't start with when an RFP is released, it starts with relationships and being out and meeting with folks before their event even hits the hits the RFP wire, you know, we say, hey, you know, we'll, we'll attend Big Ten championships. We'll go to other cities and see them and and learn from them. We go to all the other Final Fours and see what we can learn from the cities, but also be with the rights holder and and just meet them and and make sure that they know that we're really interested and we want to do this. And then it really gets into the nuts and bolts of. When they send out their requirements, we have to go through and say, okay, we got to go out and secure, you know, 8,000 hotel rooms and, and the work of actually going out and doing that, meeting with all the hotels and getting contracts and getting all the, the, the holds for that, working through how do we actually execute, like for swimming, how do you put a pool inside of a stadium, making sure that the stadium is set for that, making sure that the stadium can hold that, making sure we can get to all the days that it requires for that setup. You know, we work very closely with our partners from from uh, Visit Indy and the Capital Improvement Board who owns Lucas Oil Stadium and Convention Center and Pacer Sports Entertainment work very closely with us on our Big Ten basketball and women's Final Fours. So we work with the venue to answer all those questions. What do you have in terms of clubs and seats and technical stuff? And then we have to package it up into a pretty package and show why Indy is the best place to, to host an event. And so then we get into the things of you know, our culinary scene, our, our, our culture, our art, arts and culture scene and, and our history and our volunteers and, and quite frankly, our Hoosier hospitality and why we are a, a great uh, host city. And this, this question is going to be too general for the, you know, myriad types of events that you put on. I'm just curious about the, the flow of money here. So you are, the Indiana Sports Corp is a not-for-profit. Um, putting on these events costs money. They also generate revenue. Um, I want to put aside the economic impact part of this for a moment. We we will get to that, but uh, I'm curious. Um, yeah, uh, what kind of uh, are you? Um, are you breaking even on these events? Are you spending money? Are you spending money, but someone else, like the state of Indiana, makes money off of it? If you could try to um, encapsulate all that, how that works? 
Yeah, you know, and obviously, as you said, um, each event is very different depending on the event. But in general terms, um, you know, and, and we said we would take the, the economic impact aside for a second, but that does play into the into the calculus because, you know, many times we do lose event we lose money on events, but we lose money because it brings the economic impact and it brings the civic pride and it brings the notoriety to Indianapolis. And, and, and those are things that we weigh when we look at these events. Um, each of the events are a little bit different in terms of like, let, let's take, you know, a, a, a final four, you know, the NCAA, that's the ticket money and all that revenue that's theirs. That's theirs that they keep. That is theirs to have. So you have to fundraise within the corporate community to, in, in order to pay for these events. You know, when we hosted the college football playoff, the NBA all-star in the final four, and we had it 21, 22 and 24, you know, we, we had to raise money for that. And we had, uh, you know, that from the corporate community and the corporate community is super generous here in Indianapolis. Um, us as a nonprofit, my um, organization is basically supported from fundraisers and from the corporate community. Um, and, and they support our mission because they realize how important it is to the overall health and vibrancy of our community. And so they gladly support us. And so we run about a four million dollar core budget with the sports corp and that is fundraised every year whether we're hosting events or not and then you layer in on the events after that and you know sometimes there's opportunity for us um, maybe we might sell vip packages for the for the rights holders and we may make a little bit of money on that but almost all the time our money that we make on events goes back into the event back into the hosting of the event um, and, and what that a lot of times looks like is a, a legacy project um, something that's left behind in the in the community. How do we involve the community more in the event? Because we really think it's important that we have, um, you know, these events are more than just what's happening on the field, that actually the community feels it, they get to participate in it, they get to touch it, um, and then it lasts after the event leaves. And so many times the money that we make off of an event would go right back into the community and hosting those type of events. Um, but it is a balancing act. You have to, one of those evaluations that we talked about at the, with the funnel is how much have I fundraised in the last couple of years? Can I afford to actually go out and fundraise again for this event? You know, you just can't constantly go to the, the corporate community because they, they have limits as well, you know, and, and they get tapped out. And, and, and so we have to get creative and, and, you know, the, the state, um, the state of Indiana has seen how important these events are, and, and I give them all the credit in the world. Um, last uh, year, last session, they funded a, a bid fund that is used by entities all over the state um, to allure and track these events to the state of Indiana that we can use them for um, rights, rights fees and certain uh, expenditures on these big events, brand new events that we're going after. And, and, and they see the importance and they see how successful we've been and how we can re make a return on investment. And so we, we don't take that lightly about using uh, the state's money, you know, but but it is a tool that allows us to compete against all these other cities because these other cities are doing the same thing. They're all enacting bid funds. They're all putting money into accounts that allow them to go out and track these events and compete for these events. And so, you know, the, the state of Indiana was very generous and, and said, hey, we got to continue to compete because it's important and it's meaningful and it makes Indiana vibrant and a place to be. And yeah, and if the state of Indiana is spending money, obviously, you know, there's the the cultural side of it of, you know, they don't, they, they might say it's okay if we if we lose money on, on these events, because yeah, we, we want to bring sports, it's, it's part of who we are. Uh, there's also but that's sort of where the economic impact piece of it comes in, because they can say we're spending money, but we're gonna make some of it back. So this is actually something I've, I've been looking into for a piece I've been writing. Um, I'm curious, and um, we can get pretty granular here how you are measuring let's, let's take the final four or we can nba all-star weekend whatever is kind of easiest for you uh how specifically do you measure the economic impact we get pretty specific when we measure the economic impact of these events and these large events um we, we actually have a calculator that we have had um that has been de developed and we use it for all of our events so when we put those events in that funnel that we're thinking about bidding on we actually know the data. So we figure out how many hotel rooms there's going to be, how many people are going to come, whether they're going to fly or drive, are they going to rent cars? And we put all that information in this calculator, which has been a, it's a calculator used across the country. So it is a tried and tested cal calculus um, that spits out a number that says, here's your direct economic impact and here's your indirect economic impact. And we look at that and we say, okay, this is what it'll generate. 
these big events, we actually hire a firm, they'll come in, they'll actually do intercept surveys of people who are here. Um, and we and we get into the details of from the hotels, like how many people stayed? What was the average hotel room rate? What, you know, we'll ask people, did they did they spend money? Did they come with, um, you know, a corporate account that, or were they on their own? Because all of that matters within these events. And we actually classify them, whether they are like youth events have a different calculator than professional events, than like these mega events, because the amount of money that people were willing to spend uh, on a regular basis changes depending on what level the, the event is. So we get pretty granular in, in terms of that. And we look at the taxes and we look at what the state taxes is and the local taxes and how that spins off. And, 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 and the calculator also takes into account, like you have your general um, tourism that happens in an, a, a, on a weekend. Just because you're hosting the Final Four, um, during that week in April, there are people who traveled to Indianapolis on a regular basis during that week of, of uh, April. And so they may or may not travel now. So we actually calculate what is that lost tourism because now we have this big event that displaced that. So we're not trying to take double account for that. Um, so we actually will calculate those things. So we get real granular on that. We also now have really started to look at the, the media impact on it. What is that value of the advertising that you're getting, um, you know, in terms of the impressions um, on television? How much is that for, you know, when you say Indianapolis or, or live from Indy? What is that value to you? While that doesn't generate direct economic money coming into the community, it does generate the eyeballs and it generates the people knowing our brand and knowing our city, which when we believe changes uh, people's perception and then they say, hey, I actually want to live work and play in Indy and because it's cool, I have seen it, I, I know it. And so then long term, we start to see people um, changing. And of course, the workforce game is the big, you know, everyone's trying to battle for the workforce. And so, you know, these things help us stay on top of the workforce. So, you know, as you can see, we really get into the granular details of all these these events and the economic impact of these. Um, you know, it, it is it, it is a um, an equation that when you're looking at these, it's not perfect in terms of the media attention and things like that. It's also very hard to measure um, civic pride. You're like, you know, how proud are people that live in Indianapolis that they get to host the Final Four on a regular basis, that they just had the college football playoff, that they just had the NBA All-Star. And when they travel around the country, when I travel around the country, people all the time say to me, they either know us for the Indy 500 or they know us for our sporting events that we host. And so like that pride really helps. So like you can't, you can't put money on that, but it is mean something and it's meaningful. So, you know, it, it, it is something that we, you know, we'll spend a lot of time, we'll spend money on, um, you know, to hire consultants to really study these, this economic impact and, and really spend time and do surveys and ask them for spending habits and how far did they come and, and what did they do when they were here? Did they go visit any museums, you know, and all that kind of, you know, other discretionary spend that people will do. So you mentioned the uh, four billion dollars in economic impact since 1979. Um, does that include money spent by uh, Indiana residents, or is it only from people coming from outside for these events? That's uh, just people who are outside the market. That's brand new economic impact. And does it include any um, media exposure estimates? No, no. That's just been new. Actually, that's just been recent in the last couple of years. We've really started to look at that, and, and we have not included that in that four billion dollar mark. And what kind of uh, multiplier are you putting on it? You know, it's common in these studies to say, you know, um, $100 million was spent, but we think that money kind of pinballed around uh, for a little while. And, you know, we're putting on, you know, 50% uh, multipliers, whatever it is. Do, do you have a, a multiplier range that you generally see? So it, that's, a, that's a, a, a great question because in the, you know, when I first started in this industry, I've been doing it a long time. We used, I remember we used to just put on a multiplier like two and a half times the money. And we said that would be what the generation of, you know, the spend in the market and, and all that kind of stuff. What I will tell you is we've gotten so um, granular with these. Every category now has a different multiplier because not all the money is created equal. So and what I mean by that is like hotel revenue goes in. It may not spend the same as if you have a local restaurant that's a local owner that money is spent and, and it stays in the community at a different rate. So the multipliers are, are very different depending on the different categories of, of the money. Um, you know, I, 
I don't know the exact term, uh, exact money uh, or exact multipliers in, in the ranges that they're in because they are so granular. And it also matters you sports versus um, professional versus whether or not you want a business um, account or if you're a personal, those things actually, we also have different, different, uh, we evaluate the money differently on those too. So you, as you can see, it's gotten very technical and, and all the communities are doing this across the country. I mean, they, they all have, we've all gotten much smarter. The data is more available. And so we're using it to make decisions now. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to a couple <clears throat> economists on this and they say, you know, if you see two or above, you know, you should be suspicious because, you know, really it's more like 1.1, 1.3 is sort of tends to be uh, more accurate uh, in term because yeah, again, it, it obviously it matters where that, where that money goes. If it goes to a hotel um, that might just go to a corporate office in New York or wherever um, before it you know, bounces around Indiana at all. Um, um, how, how do you, sort of decide if, if an event is, is worth it. Do you, are there times when you say, you know, we're, we're not going to, to get enough out of, out of an event, even if uh, it, it would give us some, some pride and some recognition? Yeah. You know, it, yes, that has happened. Um, you know, and, and sometimes a lot of factors go into that. What I will tell you is many times what we run against is because we're a busy city, and because we're a popular city and we have a very vibrant convention and in sports industry, really what we fight a lot is dates. We struggle to find dates um, that we can host all these events in because we have more content that wants to come than we can actually uh, that we can host. But I will tell you that we've had um, uh, we've had times where we have said this event doesn't fit our community um, and it's not we don't believe that the returns are going to be enough for our um, community to really want to get behind it. And it's not worth that money to spend, um, you know, and, and, and it, and that doesn't mean that it's forever. It just means that at that point in time, um, because like I said, we may have had to fundraise for it. And if we have to fundraise, and let's say we, we just came off the NBA all-star game where we had to fundraise, we may not be prepared to go out and fundraise again. And it may be very difficult to do that. And so, um, you know, depending on how soon that money is needed and stuff, that will also affect it. That's a lot of times when we say, hey, you know, this isn't quite, this isn't the right time. This isn't worth it. It's many times because of other things that are factored into that, um, you know, and, and there are events that, um, you know, we, we that just don't fit our community and, and, and just doesn't work um, for us. And, and, and we say, you know, that unfortunately, we, we will have to take a pass on that. You know, it's um, many people have asked us, you know, why um, we aren't hosting a, why we weren't in the world cup game, um, you know, and, and trying to host the world cup. And we made a, made a judgment to, uh, host the final four in 26. Um, and, and we don't want to have two major events in the same year and the final four being hosted here on a regular basis. You know, that's an event that we have our, the NCAA is headquartered here. They're a partner of ours. We've hosted many final fours and we just felt very strong that that was a great, uh, direction to go in. That's no slight against FIFA Club World or FIFA World Cup. Um, that is a huge event. We we support it. We love it. We love soccer. Um, we think that's a, a a great event for the United States. But for us our, as a community, we said it's important to us to to keep our Final Four and 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 be great partners for them. So we chose to bid on that, and and luckily we were successful. All right. Well, Patrick Talty, really appreciate you taking us inside this whole world here. Thanks for joining us on the show. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend you think would like it too, or share an episode. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.